The words on the bag tell it all. Lights out. These days, every time James Tony steps into the ring, he's under a microscope and expected to show destructive force. When he doesn't, he gets to read about it. One of the primary criticisms of today's boxing champions is that they'll do anything outside the ropes to retain their titles, but sometimes not enough in the ring. That certainly wasn't the case on May 10, 1991 in Davenport, Iowa, when Tony barnstormed his way onto the boxing scene. Having been outboxed for most of 10 rounds by unbeaten champion Michael Dunn, Tony unleashed a thunderous left hook, which dropped the unbeaten fighter before his hometown crowd. The ending was now just moments away, and James Tony became a newly crowned middleweight champion. Six months later against Mike McCallum, Tony delivered what many believed was his best performance as a professional, but it earned him no better than a draw. Now Tony is criticized for how he wins his fight. Unbeaten, but not exactly overwhelming his opposition. He believes some of the lethargy has been the product of his efforts to make weight. Eight pounds north at 168, no longer an issue. Everybody right now lately been saying that I haven't been knocking nobody out and never getting my case about it. Basically, I've been having trouble with the weight, and that takes a lot of power for me. You gotta drop, you gotta drop a lot of weight and try to make 160, which I have been doing for the last year and a half. But now I'm fighting a super middle weight. I won't have no more problems, and knockout power will be restored. Like most champions, Tony claims to be more concerned with substance than with glitter. It's tempting to look down the road toward bigger fights and larger paydays, but he knows if he doesn't get by Doug DeWitt, he can kiss tomorrow goodbye. This is I'm going to my man Brock, but Doug DeWitt's first. He's first right now on the, on the plateau and everything. And I would do a good job against Doug DeWitt. Everybody would be like, damn, that's James. So that's James we used to see. Tonight, there's the hope of rejuvenated excitement for James Tony. Good fights and good opponents have had a way of bringing out the best in him. Tonight, Doug DeWitt's going to find out why they call me James Lights Out Tony. Doug DeWitt, Lights Out for you. Back live at the Mark D. Edis Arena in the Taj Mahal on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, where now it will be middleweight champion James Tony moving up eight pounds in weight to, find, uh, to fight 168-pound veteran Doug DeWitt. Larry Merchant, we've watched James Tony before. He has been the busiest champion in the sport over the course of the past year and a half. What's behind the rise in weight from 160 to 168? Despite the busyness, it's, it's, uh, it, it must just be inbred in him in his attitude as well as his body. He looks like a middleweight, but in fact, in high school, he was a 190-pound quarterback. He says lights out, but since he knocked out Michael Nunn, it's been lights on. He's won all of his fights, but he hasn't knocked out his major opponents. He says it's because he's had to work too hard to get down to the 160-pound limit, that it's uh, affected him, that he can't punch as hard, that he can't punch as much. He's up to 168. He's got to prove it to a lot of skeptics that there will be a different Tony in there, and DeWitt is a reasonable uh, opponent to show whether it does make a difference. Indeed, DeWitt is a reasonable opponent. You'll forgive us for concocting all the scenarios by which Foley could have given Barkley trouble or by which the other fighter could have given Roy Jones trouble. As you saw, it didn't happen. But now we get ready to do it again, and this time... As was the case before, again, it's for real, because Doug DeWitt, Gil Clancy, is a veteran guy who has seen what I'm sure he thinks are better fighters than James Tony in the past. Oh, he's fought some of the toughest guys in the world. He fought Tommy Hearns when he, when he was at his peak, Sambu Kalame, just about every tough guy that nobody else wanted to fight Doug DeWitt fought. Now, the problem with Doug DeWitt, Jim, and I don't like to worry everybody, is that he's a very, very slow starter. If he doesn't get that motor started early, he could be in trouble early. You mean first round? First round, middle of the second round. He's got to get those hands moving. Sometimes in the beginning of a fight, just doesn't do it. All right, well, let's take a look now at the Yonkers veteran, Doug DeWitt, as he prepares to make his way into the ring, self-managed over the course of the past several years, now being trained by Victor Valle, whom you will remember as the mentor to Jerry Cooney during Cooney's heavyweight contender days leading up to the championship bout against Larry Hall. DeWitt often says that he would have been out of the sport before now, but he keeps thinking that something good might happen to him. Frankie, Frankie, I could have been a contender. Nobody does that feat better on the current boxing scene than does Doug DeWitt. And back in 1984 and 1985, he was a contender. His horizons brought down partially by knockouts at the hands of great fighters such as Tommy Hearns. Yeah, when, when, when we talked to him the other night, here's his record. We talked to him uh, yesterday afternoon, in fact, 
and he ran through his career it was uh, it was poignant the way he spoke about it and really he was saying I could have been a contender I could have been somebody of course from that great speech by Marlon Brando in On the Waterfront written by Bud Schulberg you saw the record for Doug DeWitt 33 wins 7 losses 5 draws there's nothing new for him in the ring he has seen it all only 19 knockouts but he has shown at times knockout power and he has made as much as three hundred thousand dollars in a fight so we're talking about somebody uh, who has been around the block and uh, is going to go around it one more time now we're told that there's a hold up for james tony as he prepares to leave his dressing room because the iran barkley entourage is going right past there on their way back to their dressing room and barkley of course wants to stir it up a little bit so DeWitt may have a long wait in the ring here, and for the moment at least, he'll enjoy the spotlight. There was something right out of a movie in, in that interview we did yesterday. James Tony is coming through. It's, he's getting a safe passage now out with Jackie Cowles, his manager. Yeah, they don't want to fight Barkley now. Do it for money a little bit later down the road if Tony can put away Doug DeWitt. So you've already seen Roy Jones score the knockout over Percy Harris, an overwhelming performance by the young middleweight prospect. And you've seen Iran Barkley, overweight and out of shape, pound out a somewhat less than willing Robert Foley. And now it will be Tony's turn to show the crowd here what he's got, looking down the road toward the potential February matchup with Barkley. The woman next to Tony, the by now famous woman manager, Jackie Callum, former rock and roll publicist, who has done an effective job, really, Larry, in steering James Tony's career to the championship shot against Michael Nunn and since he won the title. She seems to know the fighter. She seems to be in tune. He is a very angry young man, suspicious of many people. Uh, and somehow he, he does connect with her, uh, and, and it's helped her. It's helped him. There are questions about James Tony still because of the indifference of some of his performances. But the record speaks for itself. 32 wins, no losses, two draws, and one of the draws was the fight with McCallum, which many regard as his best performance. 21 KOs, he does have punching power. Punch that number. No, tail of the tape first. I'll get it right. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape, and you will see the disparity in age, which jumps right out at you. Otherwise, they are similar in size, weight, and reach. Now we'll have the punch that number from Larry Mercer. There you see it, roughly equivalent numbers. Not much to choose there. Don't know what it means. Probably nothing. Tony throws a few more jabs. We expect DeWitt, who has been seen as a very aggressive fighter, to do more counterpunching, trying to get his opponent to lead in this fight. Rules about the same, Harold Letterman? Absolutely about the same. We're boxing under the rules of the New Jersey State Athletic Commission. Three judges will score the fight. Ten-point must system, standing eight count, in effect. Three knockdowns in any one round. The fight's over. Can't be saved by the bell in any round. In the case of an accidental headbutt, we go to the scorecards after five. Oh. Oh, yeah. All right, let's go up to Michael Buffer, the ring announcer for the pre-fight introduction. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Top Rank Incorporated and Budweiser present part three of this great boxing triple header. This bout is sanctioned by the New Jersey State Athletic Control Board, Boxing Commissioner Larry Hazard Sr., Chairman Jerry Gormley, Board Members Gary Shaw and Richard Harrison, Deputy Commissioner Lawrence Wallace, Physicians at Ringside, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Frank B. Doggett, Attending physicians, Dr. Earl Shaw and Dr. Charles Wilson. The timekeeper is Lindsey Tucker. The scoring will be done on a 10-point must system by the following three judges, John Potteray, John Riley, and Al DeVito. And when the bell rings, the man in charge of the action, referee Tony Orlando. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from Donald J. Trump's Taj Mahal here in Atlantic City, New Jersey, uh, Get ready to rumble! Ten rounds of boxing. This is in the super middleweight division. Introducing first.
fighting out of the red corner, wearing the black trunk with white trim from Yonkers, New York. His professional record, 33 victories against seven defeats with five draws, 19 KOs. Currently ranked number 10 in the world by the International Boxing Federation, ladies and gentlemen, Doug Cobra And his opponent across the ring, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing the gold trunks with black letters, and weighing in at an even 168 pounds. He's fighting out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, undefeated as a professional with a record of 32 and 0, two draws, 21 KOs. Currently holds the IBF middleweight championship of the world title, not on the line. Ladies and gentlemen, James Lights Out Tony. Then, well received your instructions prior to coming to the ring. Therefore, I expect you to obey all the rules and listen to my command. Okay, touch guard, go back to the corner. You know, Gil, they had this weigh-in yesterday. A fellow like Tony could have put on 10 pounds. He's a 160-pound champion. He might weigh close to 180 by now. I, I think that's really a ridiculous rule. I mean, they, they say yes, it's for the safety of the boxers. They don't like them to uh, have to dry out to make weight. But what about the fact that one guy may have a 10 or 12 pound weight advantage if one guy's a natural 168 pounds and the other guy can put on that weight in 24 hours? Now remember that Gil Clancy says Doug DeWitt is a startlingly slow beginner. So the opportunity exists here early for Tony to do some damage if he can land something. He tried a left hook and now comes with a couple of right hands. And so far DeWitt is blocking the hard stuff. Come on, Jason! the ring I see Roy Jones now seated at the right arm of Donald Trump wonder what that will uh, lead to down the road men like Donald Trump have a, an instinct in ear for stars Tony landed an uppercut there that snapped DeWitt's head back Doug trying to get out of the block a little more rapidly this time and lands a low blow and Tony Orlando lets him get away with it Tony believes he'll be a lot sharper at this weight. Yes, that's one of the things, things he said to us. He said he had to kill himself to make 160 pounds. Took all the strength out of him. He said, we're going to see a different fighter tonight. Much more effective. The common rap against him is that he does not fight the full three minutes of every round. It was graphically apparent in his last victory over Mike McCallum. And he coasted to the easy decision over McCallum. And McCallum felt as though he had been treated bad. What was that? Well, I think Tony went down because of a low blow. I think he was pushed down by Doug DeWitt and allowed himself to go down. That was his way of protesting the fact that, that DeWitt was roughing him up on the inside. I got you. And there's just the DeWitt's walking right in, not behind the jab. Tony just missed a real good left hook and just landed a good left hook. That's right. that he missed and DeWitt was wide open could have ended the bout Doug just pawing in return at Tony now he lands a body shot Tony comes with an uppercut that again snaps back ahead of Doug DeWitt Just a normal fight for Doug DeWitt. These, these are the kind of fights he's in all the time. Let's keep those punches up now. That's a warning. Let's go. Next time I'll take a point. Let's go. DeWitt waves to his fans after having survived Don't round one. You gotta get off first. You're winning a little too long with these guys. It's no good. And you gotta use that gap. He's not spacing the gap. You gotta move the gap, move the head. You're leaving the head straight. Get off. This guy is not that way. You wanna get the pin. So, all right, you got his, his best punches there. He's doing it. But don't wait for him. Yeah, right. You don't like it down there. Don't like that body shot. Keep him close. Keep him close. 
Uh, here's Tony with his best combination of the of the round. Good right hand followed by a left uppercut. He did throw quite a few punches in that round. Let's see if he can sustain that pace over several rounds. Well, this this is the one he said the weight difference is going to be. He's, he's not going to be drained. He's going to be able to sustain the attack. So let's see if it really happens. The 12 round decision over McCallum was on August 29th. Tony's had about three months to get ready to fight here at 168. Uppercut landed inside. DeWitt not offering in return as Tony goes to the body and to the head early in round two. Well, that's what DeWitt does. To he'll, he'll go and he'll, he'll let a guy throw punches and he'll get nailed with the punches. Then all of a sudden, he'll lash out and throw a good combination. DeWitt doesn't look terribly interested here, Gil. Is that the way he looks when he gets off the Yes, he, he can drive a trainer crazy. He can really drive you. I've seen him start fights like this. Start off the fights and by the fifth or sixth pound, you see a completely different fighter if he gets into the fifth or sixth pound. I've, I've seen this so many times. It looks as if he'd prefer to be somewhere else. You heard Victor Valley asking him to jab. He's got the front to call with it. And now Tony lands a short left hook in tight. DeWitt is not getting off at all. He's, he's, he's allowing Tony to set the pace. The wall is getting off. And Tony again elects to go to the canvas to illustrate the fact that he's being pushed down by a clutching Doug DeWitt. Right hand lead almost landed for DeWitt. Funny thing about Doug DeWitt, he's known to just about have an iron chin, but every once in a while, he got knocked out in a fight with an ordinary guy with one punch. Uh, Sambu Columbay, no big puncher, also stopped him, but yet I've seen him in with the guys, best bombers in the business, hit him with big shots on the chin and nothing happened. So you take a ball for Sambu Columbay and you've taken a ball. Anyway, given the opponent, the opposition needs to prepare. Roy Jones hitting power with James Tony. Well, I would have to say that uh, from, uh, Jones really impressed me tonight. I mean, I think that uh, every punch he, he shows, he throws, uh, can get you out of there with one punch. He's, he's really a bomber. 
Tony has any reputation for punching power. He owes a lot of it to one big punch. The mammoth left hook that flattens Michael Nunn. Set up his title-winning TKO of Nunn in Nunn's hometown of Davenport, Iowa. And you know, that really happens. And then, then the guy gets the reputation as a, as a puncher, and he's really not a puncher. I, I think that's one of the things that happened to Razor Riddick. He knocked out... Uh, he knocked out Michael Doak and thought he was a good left hooker in there and he forgot how to box, forgot how to jab and that's all he threw was that left hand and all his other fights. Right. And Tony's putting on some kind of an act here now. Uh, oh, there's a right cross that landed. And another a left hook that landed. But DeWitt is able to stand up so far and he's still moving his legs pretty well. As I say, uh, Jim, this is in the, another night at the office with Dr. Wood. He's fought these kind of bombers before, except that he has not shown much offense at all. I know it's a long time ago, Gil, back in 1988, but uh, DeWitt had Hearns in trouble, didn't he? I, I did that fight, and he had Tommy Hearns busted up badly over both eyes, and the fight was in Detroit, and it really looked like it was going to be stopped. It was a close fight, and Tommy Hearns won a decision, and that's when Tommy Hearns was really fight. I said 88. Let me correct myself. It was October 17, 1986. A lot of water under the bridge since then. Now DeWitt starts to fight back. Apparently, that's when DeWitt could fight, too. Well, it, he certainly isn't as good a fighter as he has been. No question about that. I'm sure Doug knows that himself. But again, he's got the experience. You see him uh, when he gets inside, he pushes James Tony down, things like that. And, uh, that's the experience of an experienced fighter. Tony's still landing a lot. In the last minute of this round, he appears to have at least awakened something in Doug DeWitt. Whether it's a real will to fight remains to be seen. Up to, up, up to this point, Doug DeWitt has not been aggressive at all. When he does become the real Doug DeWitt, he starts putting his punches together pretty good. So it's a nice combination. The box is good. It continues. The box is good. You're breaking on him with the left hook, breaking on him with the right hand. Them uppercuts that you're hitting him with, come back with the left hook behind him. You're hitting some good uppercuts. Come back to that left hook. Rough with this guy. You do danger with this guy. Get going. He's doing his best punches now. He cannot hurt you. He's never going to hurt you. And that's now go forward. Here's the second low blow of the fight by DeWitt. I would say that was down around Mexico City. And there's that straight right hand. But... DeWitt rode with the punch just enough to take this, the real shock shock out of it, Gil. That's right. When you really get nailed is when you when you get caught coming in with a punch. But he was able to go with that punch, take most of the sting out of it. And Victor Valley's really trying to light a fire under Doug DeWitt. Tell him he has to get going, has to throw his hands. Let's see now if uh, he pays attention. And we have a nice round number disparity in activity level. Through three rounds, according to punch stat numbers, Tony has attempted 178 punches, and DeWitt has attempted 78, a difference of an even 100. Tony has been more active than he promised. He won the decision over McGallum in a fight in which he was significantly less active than McGallum. The judges were impressed with the effect of his punches as opposed to the effect of those by the lighter hitting the caliber. Yeah. Hard uppercut. I can't understand what Doug DeWitt is doing. He's, he's walking back. He's not even dancing back. He's walking back against the ropes and allowing Tony to get set and throw punches. Well, I don't think DeWitt is really there. He's not the kind of fighter of whom you would say in most instances that he has shown up just to collect a paycheck. But so far tonight, we have not seen what Doug DeWitt can sometimes bring to a fight. in there, Gil. Certainly isn't. No plan. Seems to be allowing his 
attention to Wander. I don't know what else is going on in the arena. Maybe he thinks that Tony's going to wear down or get frustrated and give him an opportunity. DeWitt bouncing off the ropes toward James Tony. But he, he still is not throwing, never getting off fresh, not throwing any punches. Jim, Jim, my wife says I slur when I sleep, but I never hurt myself. Will you tell me and wake me if you hear me snoring? Was that you? I think we can depend on producer Michael Whalen to beat me to the punch on that one. If he's watching it, this fight will provide plenty of fodder for Iran Barkley to disparage his man, Tony, as they look ahead to February. Again, the, the witch just never gets off. Never gets off. Tony just missing with the long right hand, lands the uppercut. The wind is unhurt. Just ducking around and away. Larry, what was the note to which saying Larry just now when he went back to the corner? <laughs> yeah. Shook his head and uh, said something. He says, are you snoring, Larry? <laughs> Harold, how do you have the fight scored so far? Larry, not much controversy in this fight. 40 to 36, favor James Tony. Jesus, he just pounded on a guy. The only thing I can say about this fight is Doug DeWitt's got a heart as big as Philadelphia because he's taking Tony's best shots and he just hangs in there. But uh, Doug, he's got to pick up his up and he's got to start throwing punches or he's just totally out of it. One thing, James Tony does fight a three-minute round. I don't know, he's really going all out. Let's get going. I'm telling you, you can do it now. Get you on my head. Everything's coming off of that. Breaking up and setting up in the house. Go, Jack. Get going now. Get it rough. DeWitt, not terribly hurt, gave Victor Valley a look there as though he had never seen him before. <laughs> you know, he just seems like he's not even in the arena, like his mind is in the arena. said to us yesterday that through part of his career he had been bedeviled by personal problems which made it impossible for him to perform in the ring. The second half of that story is that there was a, an older woman in the room and she raised her hand and said, I'm the personal problem. And she was still there. just walks in, he's not throwing any punches, he's not fainting, he's not throwing, looking a hook to the body, he's not looking to throw a he's not looking really to throw improvement in Doug DeWitt's output. He threw 12 punches in the fourth round. Total. Left hook. Snapped DeWitt's head. But nothing has gotten to his legs yet. Another snapping left hook. And now DeWitt is staggered. See if Tony has the power to take him out. Because DeWitt has nothing right here. Taking a lot of shots. Full on.
DeWitt comes back throwing a little bit. Well, that was the first time in the bout that I felt as though DeWitt's leg had buckled. And there's another solid left hook. But he's going to make it out around four, Gil. Make it round five. You're not, you're not drawing. You're not drawing. That's the whole trouble. You're waiting for this guy to leave all the time. It's no good. You cannot wait for this guy. You got to get up and move the head. You're making a miss, but you're not drawing a point. You got to get up first. Come on. Come on. Don't get the ball. Huh? Determination in your head. For Christ's sake, he's not the greatest fighter. Here's that flurry and the wit. To his credit, stood up to some real terrible punishment. Very good body punch by Tony in the middle of all of that, Gil. Now we're talking about the punching power of James, of James Tony compared to Roy Jones. Do you think that Doug DeWitt would be there if Jones hit him with those punches? Not a chance. So then what you're saying basically is Jones is by far the harder puncher. Looks that way to me. Doesn't it look that way to you? It certainly does. Do you think DeWitt would have stood up to that barrage if it had been Roy Jones throwing the punches? No, I do not. Well, in the next six months, we'll find out, won't we? If all goes according to plan. Tony versus Barkley in February. And then down the road, the winner of Tony Barkley against Roy Jones. That's the plan. just take all the punishment. Kind of sleepwalking in there. He just is not in the fight. And Tony must be saying to himself, what do I have to hit this guy with to get some effect? one of those boxing movies in which something terrible has happened in the life of DeWitt and the people at ringside don't know about it as they watch him get pounded around the ring. I just don't think we can expect a sudden dramatic turnaround. Almost two full minutes into round six, Doug DeWitt has attempted, by punch stat computation, three punches in this round. And Victor Valley told him, you have to get off first, you have to throw punches. He just, as you said, he, he's not listening to Victor Valley. He looks at Victor Valley like he doesn't know him. Has to be frustrated for the trainer. As if Victor Valley hasn't had enough frustrations in his life already, right? Listen, Jim, I'd like to ask you, is Larry Merchant still here? <laughs> Good sound effect. Now, the witch is right then and there. Jump in and snap and try to lead and throw a punch. And all these are fighting completely defensive, which is making them take more punishment. Let him go. Let him go. Let him go. You want me to stop this way? Yeah, I don't have enough. Uh? I don't have enough. Don't All right. There's no use going on. Don't do it, right. Don't do it. Uh? Don't do it. I don't have enough. All right. That's it. I don't want it. You heard Doug DeWitt. He doesn't have anything left. Victor Valley has gone over to the referee and said, that's it. He is retiring. Well, we hope he retires. 
If that's what's left of his boxing career, he does himself a great service by retiring. They throw in the towel at the end of round six, denying the crowd even the climax of watching the man go down and take a count. But better for Doug's health that he do it that way. Well, again, he, he showed us that he had nothing in the fight, and he realized it himself, and uh, I guess it is, that was the right thing for him to do. I said at the start of this fight that we would get uh, one surprise tonight, one better fight than we thought. I couldn't have been wronger. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're entitled to one every once in a while. <laughs> it was theater of the expected tonight. The most unexpected thing being Doug DeWitt quitting on his duel at the end of six rounds. Gil, you ever had a fighter behave like that? No, I haven't. I mean, I've tried all. I've, I've had fighters that uh, wouldn't pay attention to me, but it wouldn't last long because I you think of something to do. I've told fighters, if you don't go out this round and back the guy up the entire round, when you come back, I'm not going to be in the corner. It's different things. You try different things. And I'm sure Victor was frustrated. He was trying to do everything he could, but Dr. Witt just wasn't there tonight, which we pointed out from the very beginning. It looked like his mind was completely someplace else. Harold, did you score at a nice, neat 54 to uh, 60? Yeah, I guess so, Jim, but I want to tell you something. I saw more punches than Ty Dobie against Clark Provet, and I saw Doug the Whistler throw the night. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who aren't hockey fans, Harold is thinking back to a National Hockey League bout earlier this week between Domi and Probert. Right now, let's go up the ring announcer Michael Buffer for the official particulars of this one. Ladies and gentlemen, the corner of Doug DeWitt asked the referee Tony Orlando to stop the bout as he was unable to continue the winner by technical knockout at the end of round number six. His record now 33 0 and 2, 22 KOs. James lights out. Punch that numbers in that match. You want to call it that. And you see that DeWitt landed 31 of an attempted 113 punches. Of those 113 attempted punches, I believe nine were in rounds five and six. Six attempted punches in round five, three in round six. And that was that for Doug DeWitt, who showed some to call a halt to what was already a lost cause. Let's go to Larry Merchant with James Tony. James, you said you'd be more active at this weight. Do you think you were? How did you feel? What do you think? Well, I know what I think and what we said at ringside, but I'd like to know how you felt and were you able to sustain more punching in that fight? Before I answer that, I want to say to my special girl at home, Sarah, and my little baby daughter, Jasmine, you guys, and I'll say hello to Elizabeth and Kevin, and my best friend, she's like a little mother to me, Bob. Who's laid up right now? She's supposed to come out, but you know she couldn't make it. Everybody, my boys back in the hood, Jimmy, Scott here. What's happening? What was happening in this fight? Tell us about your act. Oh, I came out, you know, like I said, to stab his, stab his dominance right away, and um, you know, he, you know, he tried a little dirty tactic to hold me down. And everything but did, like you that. Feel, did you feel, did you feel, James, that you were able to do what you said you would at this weight? No, I definitely was. You know, I was able to move around, do what I want to, pull him around, punch him. I'm, I'm sitting with some very hard body shots, and you, you, you probably saw him wince a lot and try to hold his breath and try to get it back. We couldn't. Are you going to ever fight at 160 again? Bob Barron, where you at? <laughs> All depends. But Bob Barron, he's my man and everything right now. You know, he don't look out for my best interest, but, you know, Bob come up with some money, you know. He's my man. I have no faith in my man here. You know, if it happens, it happens, but it's all about the money. But you don't want to. Okay. And Ryan Barkley said some pretty nasty I things about you. Then. Why? What is this? What is this between the two of you? You know, I like Iran's person. You know, first he did, he, did, he did like I did, came up the hard way. But this is his business. You know, I want his title, and I want it bad, I'm going to get it. You know, I heard about this, and he's going to kill me, kill me. Man, I'm going to stop him. He can't kill me. Let's get kryptonite. Kryptonite ain't going to do it. Okay, no kryptonite in this fight or in the fight in February, presumably. Back to you, Jim. All right, thanks very much, Larry. Well, James Tony Gill got, uh, perhaps to his benefit, the lengthiest workout of the evening. Let's look ahead now and begin to handicap Barkley Tony on the basis of what you saw here. Well, you know, uh, Jim, what we saw tonight really was that Bar Barkley had a workout, Tony had a workout, and Barkley had the bigger guy, and uh, I guess that Tony had the guy that was supposed to have the more skills, but he wasn't in it at all tonight. And it really would be tough to handicap uh, either guy off, the, off this performance. Barkley was out of shape. 
threw wide punches, but still has that great heart and that great determination. And, and Tony, at this weight, certainly was more active. If you were training James Tony, would you see it as a bit of a setback that he didn't get more of a challenge tonight in his first outing at that weight? Well, I, I would, uh, yes, if I was training him, I, I would like to see a more competitive fight. Uh, I never believed in putting guys in, in no contest fights. You know, I'm thinking of something you told us yesterday. When Doug DeWitt told us with whom he had been sparring, you had an instinct that he might show up with nothing tonight. Well, you know, uh, when fighters get a little older, at least the way I train fighters, I never gave them tough workouts in the gymnasium. I would put them in with skilled fighters so that they could try to improve their speed, but never with big, strong guys that would take something out of them every day instead of putting it in. And what, what I understand, he was working out with one of the biggest, strongest light heavyweights in New York for at least 10 days before the fight. And I was worried that he may not have anything in this fight because of that. He may have left it all in the gym. This will be the last chance we get to talk to you. Looking back over the whole course of the evening, I guess the most impressive thing was Roy Jones's quickness and punching power. He, he certainly impressed me, again, because I know that Percy Harris was a skilled fighter, a good boxer. Uh, again, he uh, gave a good account of himself a guy who, against a guy who just fought for the championship of the world. But tonight, he was just completely overmatched with young Roy Jones. You'll be with us on January 16, won't you, when George Foreman takes on Pierre Kutzer and Tommy Morrison has Carl the Truth Williams? Well, you know, I'm George F. Foreman's designated hitter, so That's I probably right. will. How do you see that? Do you think Kutzer can give Foreman a challenge? Well, you know, I, uh, I don't think Kutzer can hurt, uh, hurt, can hurt Big George, and uh, I think George will just roll over him like a big mountain. And will Tommy Morrison knock out Carl the Truth Williams? Again, you know, I've seen Carl the Truth Williams get hit on a chin and do funny things after he gets hit, but I've seen him other nights when he really showed good boxing skills with a good jab. And, uh, you know, Tommy Morrison, after three or four rounds, has never been that great a fighter. So it, it is an interesting fight. All right. Pleasure to have you with us, as always. Thanks very much. My pleasure, young man. All right, Gil. Let's turn back to Larry Merchant now, who, having aroused himself from the uh, sleepiness and the torpor of that last fight, gets a chance now to sum up the entire evening. And never, I think, have you had a tougher job. Well, it was just a night of the fight. Uh, there were enough people here, certainly, to fill my living room and my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> but as I watched all the favorites uh, roll over their opponents, uh, uh, some of whom had some skills, but just not the stuff to deal with that class of fighter, I was reminded of a, a kid I saw out on the boardwalk yesterday. And, and the board, it's been cold and blowing, and it's sort of desolate. Uh, looks like the, uh, the seagulls there are out there with scarves on. And there are people who are trying to pass out these uh, flyers to get, to get you to go to restaurants around town and so forth and so on. And it's a kind of a difficult job, a dead-end job. And most of the guys I was watching were just, looked like they were angry with you there. But there was this one kid, and it turned out his name was Quinn, and he was just jumping all around. And he was just happy and talking to everybody. And I went over and I said, gee, who are you? Quinn and so on and I said boy you're gonna be running this town someday and he said someday soon and that's what champions are you just can't keep a champion down and these guys won on their class and their will against inferior opponents and just rolled over them and uh, the guys who won were supposed to win I thought you were gonna tell me that Roy Jones is gonna be running this town sometime <laughs> soon he may be running the boxing world someday soon he was certainly impressive that's uh, indeed the most impressive thing we saw tonight was Roy Jones's performance in the first of the three bouts. So let's take a look back now, once again, at the official particulars and brief moments of the action from all three of the bouts. First of all, Roy Jones, winner on a TKO at the end of round four in the opening bout of the evening against Percy Harris. 20th consecutive victory for Jones. He knocked out a guy who had been in with a tough puncher in Lamar Parks and went to the 10th round. Jones looked terrific. Then Iran Barkley, clearly out of shape, taking on a less than willing Robert Foley. He got the KO at 248 of round number four on this very average overhand right hand against Foley, who stood still and took it and stayed on the canvas for the count. Barkley looks ahead now to his meeting in February with James Tony, the 160-pound champion who moved up to 168 pounds for the first time tonight and fought against a largely non-existent Doug DeWitt. DeWitt, a guy who on his record might have been expected to give Tony some interesting moments, gave him absolutely none. It was a workout and nothing more for James Tony. DeWitt quit on his stool at the end of round six. Coming up on HBO Sports, be sure to join us Tuesday, December 8 at 10 o'clock p.m.
When HBO Sports presents a special boxing documentary for young and old fans alike, in this corner, boxing's legendary heavyweight to look at 100 years of heavyweight history as you've never seen it before. And also join Lynn Dawson, Nick Bonacani, and Chris Collinsworth for HBO's Inside the NFL, Pro Football's most informative hour, next Thursday at a special time, 11.30 p.m. And World Championship Boxing returns in January with a doubleheader as George Foreman takes on Pierre Kutzer and Tommy Morrison goes up against Carl the Truth Williams January 16th. Stay tuned immediately following tonight's boxing coverage for Wild Orchid on the East Coast and the Adams Family on the West Coast. And now for Larry Merchant, George Foreman, Gil Clancy, and Harold Letterman, I'm Jim Lampley saying so long from Atlantic City. The executive producer of HBO Sports is Ross Greenberg. Tonight's telecast was produced by Michael J. Whalen and directed by Mark Payton. The associate producers were Brian McDonald and Kendall Reed. The associate directors, Betsy Aronin and Paul Farnsworth. The assistants to the producer were Dave Leakston, Adam Berger, and Artie Curry. The production manager was Russell Gabay. Technical supervisor was George Wenzel. of HBO Sports, the network of champions.